continuing Mark chapter 8 from verses 31 to 38 and Mark chapter 9 verse 1, which is really the conclusion of this thought uh, of this uh, sharing of the Lord Jesus Christ. So verses 31 through 33, we've just seen the Jewish concept of Messiah. We shared nine points in the last recording in the first part of Mark chapter 8. Now, Jesus begins to teach them that he, the Son of Man, must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, be killed, and after three days rise again. And he spoke this openly. And Peter, Mark 8, 32, took the Lord Jesus aside and began to rebuke Peter. You know, my friend, you may be called to be a leader in your local setting, but you better know your limits. You don't try to rebuke the Son of God. Rather, we are to submit and yield to him, to hear from him, to listen to him, and to follow his leading. So when Jesus shares with them how he's going to be killed and rise after, from the dead after three days, Peter takes him aside and begins to rebuke him. And then it says, verse 33, Jesus turned around, looked at all the disciples, in other words, kind of stared them down said follow me now listen to me what i'm gonna do and then he comes back to peter and he rebukes peter and says get behind me satan obviously peter is not satan but he's voicing exactly what satan wants jesus to do jesus is addressing the source but peter get peter gets the rebuke for listening to the voice of satan just like us Believers in Jesus Christ, many times we do hear the wrong voice. The key is we are to reject it. So Jesus settles on Peter and says, Get behind me, Satan. You do not savor. You are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. You don't want God's way. You don't want me to do things God's way, to go to the cross. You want me to do it your way and be a typical, traditional Jewish Messiah and conquer Rome right now. The tempter's voice. Against this backdrop, Jesus is talking about his forthcoming death and suffering. To the disciples, it's incomprehensible. It's not possible. You can perform all these miracles, walk on water, uh, cast out demons, heal a deaf mute, give a blind man sight, uh, feed 5,000, feed 4,000. There's no way you could be killed. It's impossible. They are looking at it from their human perspective without God's divine plan that was foreordained before the foundations of the world. For them, there's an incomprehension. So Peter says, no way, Lord. Jesus sternly rebukes Peter. Why? Because Peter was verbalizing the same temptations that the Lord Jesus in his humanness was himself fighting. This is similar to Satan tempting Jesus in the wilderness to take his, Satan's way, instead of God's way. It, listen to this statement. It is both strange and terrible that the tempter often talks to us in the voice of well-meaning friends with the best intentions. I'll say that again. It's both strange and terrible that the tempter, Satan, often talks to us in the voice of well-meaning friends with the best intentions. Beware, my friend. Discern by the Spirit of God and have it confirmed by the Word of God what is God's perfect and holy will for your life. Verses 34 and 35. When Jesus called the people to himself with his disciples, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, this is a powerful verse, we all know this, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will find it. Here we have a definition of true discipleship straight from the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice a couple of things. Number one, 
Jesus' honesty about being a disciple of his. He does not make any false promises, no bribes. There's no easy way to glory. In the Second World War, Prime Minister Winston Churchill of England offered men blood, sweat, toil, and tears. The Lord Jesus never lured, but challenged men. His is the highest and hardest challenge. Christ has not called us to make life easy, but he's called us to make men great. His call to us is not to make life easy, but to make men, men, women, boys and girls great. Second thing about discipleship. The Lord Jesus never asks us to do the impossible. He'll only ask us to do what he has already gifted us to do or what he enables us by his awesome Holy Spirit indwelling in us to do. What about take up your cross? He took up his own first. Thirdly, he said we are to deny ourselves. We are to say no to self-seeking and self-will. We are to deny our flesh and to follow his holy will. In verse 36, simple but powerful statement. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? I titled this, Finding Life by Losing It. Finding Life by Losing It. Certain things are lost by being kept and saved by being used. I'll say that again. Certain things are lost by being kept and saved by being used. Example, whatever gift or talent God has given you. For example, you might be a fabulous artist. It comes naturally to you. That's a skill I wish I were endowed with, but I'm not. Whatever your gift may be, use it, not just for self-glorification, but to expand the kingdom of God on this earth. If you don't use it, it's wasted, it's lost. It's saved by being used and lost by being kept selfishly to ourselves. There was a story of an Eastern monk in the days of the Roman oppression of Israel named Telemachus. And he had given himself to a life of asceticism, like a hermit. However, Becoming a Christian, he gives up the ascetic lifestyle and he travels to Rome to share Christ. He comes upon the Roman amphitheater where he sees in the arena gladiators about to kill each other. And before they do so, they first face where Caesar is sitting, raise their hands in the salute and say, Hail Caesar, we who are about to die salute you. And then, at the sound of the trumpet or the drop of, of, a, of a handkerchief or whatever, they began, began to set upon each other to kill each other. Telemachus, now watching this, in horror, finding out they were going to kill each other, he leaps over the barrier, rushes between the gladiators, and at first the, the people sitting there for amusement think it's silly and get upset and angry with him. Next thing, one flash of the gladiator's sword and Telemachus is slain. His dead body lies in the arena. And suddenly a huge hush falls upon the whole crowd. There's a mass realization. As the crowds become silent, the games are abruptly ended. Telemachus's death was more useful to mankind than his life. His death was more useful to mankind than his life. Friend, God gave us life to give and not to keep. Shall I say that again? God gave us life to give and not to keep. Here's another way of putting it. It is better to burn out than to rust out. Don't sit idly by. Let that flame of your life burn till the last moment or last breath 
for our Lord Jesus Christ. It is better to burn out than to rust out. Verse 37, another short, powerful scripture. Mark 8, 37. Now what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Here the Lord Jesus is teaching us some supreme values in life. It's quite possible a man may be a huge success, be it fame or money, but yet living a life that is hollow and not worth living. Where do you and I, what kind of values do we have? Some men sacrifice honor and honesty for profit. Listen to this statement. They rob their soul to feed the sill, S-I-L-L, -L, or you can say T-I-L-L, till. They rob the soul to feed the sill. How does life's balance sheet look in God's eyes? He is the final auditor. He is the chief and final arbiter and judge of all flesh. Some men sacrifice principle for popularity opposition. Some men sacrifice principle for popularity or position. If only some of us would serve our God with half the zeal we serve our bosses at work. Shall I say that again? If only some of us would serve our God with half the zeal with which we serve our bosses at our secular place of work. Don't sacrifice eternity for the moment, my friend. Don't sacrifice eternity for the moment. And then the last verse, 38 of chapter 8 and chapter 9, verse 1. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And in chapter 9, verse 1, the Lord Jesus says, to end this discourse, but there'll be some here, standing here, who will see the glory of the coming kingdom of the Son of Man. Now watch this. Obviously, the first part, we are, if we are ashamed of him, he will be ashamed of us. We are called to stand up, stand up for Jesus. Not only our words, but our very lives, our actions, our deeds are to testify to the saving power and the work of the grace of God in our lives and to salvation through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Never be ashamed to stand for who and what you believe. If not, the Lord says, I will be ashamed to testify about you before my Father and his holy angels. But now watch the confidence of the Lord Jesus. Even with the cross looming before him, he knows for sure he will triumph in the end because God is faithful to those who are loyal to him. Again, God is faithful to those who are loyal to him. And scarcely 30 years after the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, Christianity had swept. Jesus says in Mark chapter 9 verse 1, There'll be some standing here who will see the kingdom and its power in belly 30 years after the resurrection of Christ. Christianity had swept through Asia Minor, Antioch, Alexandria, Rome, Greece. It had become an unstoppable tide that was turning the then world right side up. Jesus was right. He always is. He never doubted. What is impossible with man is completely possible with God. Again, that brings us to the end of chapter 8 of Mark's Gospel, halfway point in this book study. If you are blessed, do subscribe to our channel. Hit the notification bell, like, share, and comment below. Thank you. God bless.